Far from the Madding Crowd, Chapter 31 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter 31 Blame, Fury. The next evening, Bathsheba, with the idea of getting out of the way of Mr. Boldwood in the event of his returning to answer her note in person, proceeded to fulfil an engagement made with Liddy some few hours earlier. Bathsheba's companion, as a gauge of their reconciliation, had been granted a week's holiday to visit her sister, who was married to a thriving hurdler and cattle-crib-maker, living in a delightful labyrinth of hazel copse not far beyond Yalbury. The arrangement was that Miss Everdeen should honour them by coming there for a day or two to inspect some ingenious contrivances which the man of the woods had introduced into his wares. Leaving her instructions with Gabriel and Mary Ann that they were to see everything carefully locked up for the night, she went out of the house just at the close of a timely thunder-shower, which had refined the air and daintily bathed the coat of the land, though all beneath was dry as ever. Freshness was exhaled in an essence from the varied contours of bank and hollow, as if the earth breathed maiden breath, and the pleased birds were hymning to the scene. Before her, among the clouds, there was a contrast in the shape of layers of fierce light, which showed themselves in the neighbourhood of a hidden sun, lingering on to the farthest northwest corner of the heavens that this midsummer season allowed. She had walked nearly two miles of her journey, watching how the day was retreating, and thinking how the time of deeds was quietly melting into the time of thought, to give place in its turn to the time of prayer and sleep, when she beheld advancing over Yalbury Hill the very man she sought so anxiously to elude. Boldwood was stepping on, not with that quiet tread of reserved strength which was his customary gait, in which he always seemed to be balancing two thoughts. His manner was stunned and sluggish now. Boldwood had for the first time been awakened to woman's privileges in tergiversation, even when it involves another person's possible blight. That Bathsheba was a firm and positive girl, far less inconsequent than her fellows, had been the very lung of his hope, for he had held that these qualities would lead her to adhere to a straight course for consistency's sake, and accept him though her fancy might not flood him with the iridescent hues of uncritical love. But the argument now came back as sorry gleams from a broken mirror. The discovery was no less a scourge than a surprise. He came on, looking upon the ground, and did not see Bathsheba till they were less than a stone's throw apart. He looked up at the sound of her pit-pat, and his changed appearance sufficiently denoted to her the depth and strength of the feelings paralysed by her letter. "'Oh, is it you, Mr. Bulwood? she faltered, a guilty warmth pulsing in her face. "'Those who have the power of reproaching in silence may find it a means more effective than words. There are accents in the eye which are not on the tongue, and more tales come from pale lips than can enter an ear.' It is both the grandeur and the pain of the remoter moods that they avoid the pathway of sound. Boldwood's look was unanswerable. Seeing she turned a little aside, he said, "'What, are you afraid of me?' "'Why should you say that?' said Bathsheba. "'I fancied you looked so,' said he, "'and it is most strange because of its contrast with my feeling for you.' She regained self-possession, fixed her eyes calmly, and waited. "'You know what that feeling is,' continued Boldwood deliberately, "'a thing strong as death. "'No dismissal by a hasty letter affects that.' "'I wish you did not feel so strongly about me,' she murmured. "'It is generous of you, and more than I deserve, "'but I must not hear it now. "'Hear it? "'What do you think I have to say, then? "'I am not to marry you, and that's enough. "'Your letter was excellently plain. "'I want you to hear nothing, not I.' Bathsheba was unable to direct her will into any definite groove for freeing herself from this fearfully awkward position. She confusedly said, "'Good evening,' and was moving on. Boldwood walked up to her, heavily and dully. 
Bathsheba, darling, is it final indeed? Indeed it is. Oh, Bathsheba, have pity upon me, Boldwood burst out. God's sake, yes, I am come to that low, lowest stage to ask a woman for pity. Still, she is you, she is you. Bathsheba commanded herself well, but she could hardly get a clear voice for what came instinctively to her lips. There is little honour to a woman in that speech. It was only whispered, for something unutterably mournful, no less than distressing in this spectacle of a man showing himself to be so entirely the vein of a passion, enervated the feminine instinct for punctilios. "'I am beyond myself about this, and am mad,' he said. "'I am no stoic at all to be supplicating here, but I do supplicate to you. I wish you knew what is in me of devotion to you. But it is impossible, that—' "'In bare human mercy to a lonely man, don't throw me off now. "'I don't throw you off. Indeed, how can I? I never had you.' "'In her noon-clear sense that she had never loved him, "'she forgot for a moment her thoughtless angle on that day in February. "'But there was a time when you turned to me before I thought of you. "'I don't reproach you, for even now I feel that the ignorant and cold darkness "'that I should have lived in, if you had not attracted me by that letter— "'Valentine, you call it, would have been worse than my knowledge of you, "'though it has brought this misery. "'But I say there was a time when I knew nothing of you "'and cared nothing for you, and yet you drew me on. "'And if you say you gave me no encouragement, I cannot but contradict you. "'What you call encouragement was the childish game of an idle minute. "'I have bitterly repented of it, I bitterly and in tears. "'Can you still go on reminding me? "'I don't accuse you of it, I deplore it. I took for earnest what you insist was jest, and now this that I pray to be jest, you say is awful, wretched, earnest. Our moods meet at wrong places. I wish your feeling was more like mine, or my feeling more like yours. Oh, could I but have foreseen the torture that trifling trick was going to lead me into, how I should have cursed you. But only having been able to see it since, I cannot do it, for I love you too well." "'but it is weak, idle drivelling to go on like this. "'Bathsheba, you are the first woman of any shade or nature "'that I have ever looked at to love, "'and it is the having been so near claiming you for my own "'that makes this denial so hard to bear. "'How nearly you promised me! "'But I don't speak now to move your heart "'and make you grieve because of my pain. "'It is no use, that. "'I must bear it. "'My pain would get no less by paining you.' "'But I do pity you, deeply, oh, so deeply,' she earnestly said. "'Do no such thing, do no such thing. "'Your dear love, Bathsheba, is such a vast thing beside your pity, "'that the loss of your pity as well as your love is no great addition to my sorrow, "'nor does the gain of your pity make it sensibly less. "'Oh, sweet, how dearly you spoke to me behind the spear-bed at the washing-pool, "'and in the barn at the shearing, and that dearest last time in the evening at your home.' "'Where are your pleasant words all gone, your earnest hope to be able to love me? "'Where is your firm conviction that you would get to care for me very much? "'Really forgotten? Really?' "'She checked emotion, looked him quietly and clearly in the face, "'and said, in her low, firm voice, "'Mr. Boldwood, I promised you nothing. "'Would you have had me a woman of clay when you paid me that furthest, highest compliment "'a man can pay a woman, telling her that he loves her?' I was bound to show some feeling, if I would not be a graceless shrew. Yet each of those pleasures was just for the day, the day just for the pleasure. How was I to know that what is a pastime to all other men was death to you? Have reason, do, and think more kindly of me. Well, never mind arguing, never mind. One thing is sure, you were all but mine, and now you are not nearly mine. Everything is changed, and that by you alone, remember. You were nothing to me once, and I was contented. You are now nothing to me again, and how different the second nothing is from the first. Would to God you had never taken me up, since it was only to throw me down. Bathsheba, in spite of her metal, began to feel unmistakable signs that she was inherently the weaker vessel. She strove miserably against this femininity, which would insist upon supplying unbidden emotions in stronger and stronger current. She had tried to elude agitation by fixing her mind on the trees, sky, any trivial object before her eyes, whilst his reproaches fell, but ingenuity could not save her now. 
"'I did not take you up. Surely I did not,' she answered as heroically as she could. "'But don't be in this mood with me. I can endure being told I am in the wrong, if you will only tell it me gently. Oh, sir, will you not kindly forgive me and look at it cheerfully?' "'Cheerfully? Can a man fool to utter heart-burning find a reason for being merry? If I have lost, how can I be as if I had won? Heavens, you must be heartless, quite. Had I known what a fearfully bitter sweet this was to be, how I would have avoided you and never seen you and been deaf to you. I tell you all this, but what do you care? You don't care. She returned silent and weak denials to his charges, and swayed her head desperately, as if to thrust away the words as they came showering about her ears from the lips of the trembling man in the climax of life, with his bronzed Roman face and fine frame. "'Dearest, dearest, I am wavering even now between the two opposites of recklessly renouncing you and labouring humbly for you again. Forget that you have said no, and let it be as it was. Say, Bathsheba, that you only wrote that refusal to me in fun. Come, say it to me. It would be untrue and painful to both of us. You overrate my capacity for love. I don't possess half the warmth of nature you believe me to have. An unprotected childhood in a cold world has beaten gentleness out of me. He immediately said with more resentment, That may be true somewhat, but ah, Miss Everdeen, it won't do as a reason. You are not the cold woman you would have me believe. No, no, it isn't because you have no feeling in you that you don't love me. You naturally would have me think so. You would hide from me that you have a burning heart like mine. You have love enough, but it is turned into a new channel. I know where. The swift music of her heart became hubbub now, and she throbbed to extremity. He was coming to Troy. He did then know what had occurred, and the name fell from his lips the next moment. "'Why did Troy not leave my treasure alone?' he asked fiercely. "'When I had no thought of injuring him, why did he force himself upon your notice? Before he worried you, your inclination was to have me. When next I should have come to you, your answer would have been yes.' "'Can you deny it? I ask you, can you deny it?' She delayed the reply, but was too honest to withhold it. "'I cannot,' she whispered. "'I know you cannot, but he stole in in my absence and robbed me. Why didn't he win you away before, when nobody would have been grieved, when nobody would have been set tail-bearing? Now the people sneer at me, the very hills and sky seem to laugh at me till I blush shamefully for my folly.' I have lost my respect, my good name, my standing, lost it, never to get it again. Go and marry your man. Go on. Oh, sir, Mr. Boldwood, you may as well. I have no further claim upon you. As for me, I had better go somewhere alone and hide and pray. I loved a woman once. I am now ashamed. When I am dead, they'll say, miserable, lovesick man that he was. "'Heaven, heaven, if I had got jilted secretly, and the dishonour not known, and my position kept! But no matter, it is gone, and the woman not gained. Shame upon him! Shame!' His unreasonable anger terrified her, and she glided from him, without obviously moving, as she said, "'I am only a girl. Do not speak to me so. All the time you knew, how very well you knew, that your new freak was my misery, dazzled by brass and scarlet!' "'Oh, Bathsheba, this is woman's folly indeed.' She fired up at once. "'You are taking too much upon yourself,' she said vehemently. "'Everybody is upon me, everybody. It is unmanly to attack a woman so. I have nobody in the world to fight my battles for me. But no mercy is shown. Yet if a thousand of you sneer and say things against me, I will not be put down. You'll chatter with him doubtless about me. Say to him, Boldwood would have died for me. Yes, and you have given way to him, knowing him to be not the man for you. He has kissed you, claimed you as his. Do you hear? He has kissed you. Deny it. The most tragic woman is cowed by a tragic man, and although Boldwood was, in vehemence and glow, nearly her own self rendered into another sex, Bathsheba's cheek quivered. She gasped. Leave me, sir, leave me. I am nothing to you. Let me go on. "'Deny that he has kissed you. I shall not.' "'Ha! Then he has!' came hoarsely from the farmer. "'He has,' she said slowly, and in spite of her fear, defiantly, "'I am not ashamed to speak the truth.' "'Then curse him and curse him!' said Boldwood, breaking into a whispered fury. 
whilst I would have given worlds to touch your hand, you have let a rake come in without right or ceremony, and kiss you! Heaven's mercy! Kiss you! Ah! A time of his life shall come when he will have to repent, and think wretchedly of the pain he has caused another man, and then may he ache and wish and curse and yearn, as I do now. Don't! Don't! Oh, don't pray down evil upon him! she implored in a miserable cry. Anything but that! Anything! Oh, be kind to him, sir, for I love him true! Boldwood's ideas had reached that point of fusion at which outline and consistency entirely disappear. The impending night appeared to concentrate in his eye. He did not hear her at all now. I'll punish him by my soul, that will I! I'll meet him, soldier or no, and I'll horsewhip the untimely stripling for this reckless theft of my one delight. If he were a hundred men, I'd horsewhip him. He dropped his voice suddenly and unnaturally. Bathsheba, sweet, lost coquette, pardon me. I've been blaming you, threatening you, behaving like a churl to you, when he's the greatest sinner. He stole your dear heart away with his unfathomable lies. It is a fortunate thing for him that he's gone back to his regiment, that he's away up the country and not here. I hope he may not return here just yet. I pray God he may not come into my sight, for I may be tempted beyond myself. Oh, Bathsheba, keep him away, yes, keep him away from me. For a moment, Bolwood stood so inertly after this, that his soul seemed to have been entirely exhaled with the breath of his passionate words. He turned his face away and withdrew, and his form was soon covered over by the twilight, as his footsteps mixed in with the low hiss of the leafy trees. Bathsheba, who had been standing motionless as a model, all this latter time, flung her hands to her face, and wildly attempted to ponder on the exhibition which had just passed away. Such astounding wells of fevered feeling in a still man like Mr. Boldwood were incomprehensible, dreadful. Instead of being a man trained to repression, he was what she had seen him. The force of the farmer's threats lay in their relation to a circumstance known at present only to herself. Her lover was coming back to Weatherbury in the course of the very next day or two. Troy had not returned to his distant barrack, as Boldwood and others supposed, but had merely gone to visit some acquaintance in Bath, and had yet a week or more remaining to his furlough. She felt wretchedly certain that if he revisited her just at this nick of time, and came into contact with Boldwood, a fierce quarrel would be the consequence. She panted with solicitude when she thought of possible injury to Troy. The least spark would kindle the farmer's swift feelings of rage and jealousy. He would lose his self-mastery, as he had this evening. Troy's blitheness might become aggressive. It might take the direction of derision, and Boldwood's anger might then take the direction of revenge. With almost a morbid dread of being thought a gushing girl, this guide this woman too well concealed from the world under a manner of carelessness the warm depths of her strong emotions. But now there was no reserve. In her distraction, instead of advancing further, she walked up and down, beating the air with her fingers, pressing her brow, and sobbing brokenly to herself. Then she sat down on a heap of stones by the wayside to think. There she remained long. Above the dark margin of the earth appeared foreshores and promontories of coppery cloud, bounding a green and pellucid expanse in the western sky. Amaranthine glosses came over them then, and the unresting world wheeled her round to a contrasting prospect eastward, in the shape of indecisive and palpitating stars. She gazed upon their silent throes amid the shades of space, but realised none at all. Her troubled spirit was far away with Troy. End of chapter 31